no game design is a smooth path. I think people have this misconception that uh, you will have an idea for a game and that is the perfect encapsulation of, of the idea and the mechanics and nothing should change from the moment of conception to the moment of release. And I find maybe and one or two auteurs can pull that off, but like really, uh, especially in the digital uh, space more so than the tabletop space, like game design is collaborative. Like I'm working on a team of four. I've got two game devs I got to work with who handle the programming and tell me what can't, can and can't be done. We have a wonderful artist on staff who, who, who brings her own ideas about what the theme and, and such is. And we have all of the play testers who like, tell us when things are working and when they're not working. And so it is not a straight shot to the final product. It is a wobbly line. Uh, you you want to give yourself a couple of guide stars to sort of aim at so that you don't get lost in the wilderness. Let's discover the Cleveland entrepreneurial ecosystem. We are telling the stories of its entrepreneurs and those supporting them. Welcome to the Lay of the Land podcast, where we are exploring what people are building in Cleveland. I am your host, Jeffrey Stern, and today I had the pleasure of speaking with Patrick Howard and Ben Canales about video games, game design, and building a gaming studio. Patrick is the CEO and a game developer of Rustbit Studio, building games like The Grip of Madness, which we cover in great detail in our conversation here today. He is an entrepreneur passionate about building memorable experiences that keep players coming back. Ben is an architect by day and a game designer by night. He comes to the table with a decade of experience designing board games and now video games where he is the lead game designer at Rustbit Studio. Rustbit itself is a software accelerator client out of the Bounce Innovation Hub in Akron, born out of another gaming startup called Strife AI, and is currently in the process of releasing The Grip of Madness, the studio's debut game. I very much enjoyed getting into the weeds here on game design and game mechanics and what the overall process looks like for bringing a game to market. So please enjoy my conversation with Patrick Howard and Ben Canales. I would love to start with a little introduction and tie actually here some voices to names so that everyone tuning in knows uh, who is who before we, we kind of kick off the story. So if you guys could just you know go ahead and, and introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about uh, yourselves and, and we'll, we'll dive in shortly after to the story of, of Rustbit. Yeah, so hi, my name is Patrick. I'm the CEO and Director of Experiences at Rustbit. Originally from Cincinnati, moved here to Akron for college and everything. And I, I met one of our co-founders here who happens to be my boyfriend. We both love video games and we love designing experiences. And we uh, started this journey a couple years back uh, with, a, with another friend. And it's like we ended up kind of jumping ship, going from uh, a couple more startups to where we are today. And uh, I'm Ben Canellis. I'm a lead game designer at Rustbit Studio. My background, at least in the game design space, is uh, I uh, freelanced as a uh, tabletop game designer for probably close to a decade at this point. When Patrick and the rest of the team reached out to me about bringing me in to handle the the game design for the studio, I I, I jumped at the opportunity. It was it was always been a dream of mine to to work on video games and it's just been a great experience being able to get uh get into the guts of it so yeah yeah i'd love to pull on that thread a little bit more if if you guys would would mind just speaking to where your desire to work in the the video game industry came from and, and really where that crossed with an interest in in entrepreneurship Personally, for me, it's like, so I have, I have a background in, in customer service. I worked at a history museum as a teenager. So I, I loved, like, I dressed up in, like, costumes. I, like, you know, talk, talk to people about history. And I, I loved, like, creating, like, really memorable experiences there. Also a bit of a software engineer. And I loved being able to create, like, creative, memorable experiences there as well. And uh, honestly, just finding, like, you know, where, uh, where those two paths cross in, like, video games and everything it was just something that I just really, you know, enjoyed. The entrepreneurship aspect of it, I, I would probably say, like, I've always been also into 
you know, tech startups. I always really admired uh, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, like the stories of how they came to be as a kid. Really like admiring, like being able to like run your own business and was just personally just always an aspiration of mine. So it kind of just led me to this point, I guess. <laughs> I have, I have friends and people that I know in the tabletop industry that, that run their own companies and the uh, entrepreneurship angle of it has never been my <laughs> strong suit, let's say. I, I've always sort of been, you know, the, the game and the experience first, but I always watched uh, what they what they did and, and thought, like, can I pull that off? Like, is that something I could do? And this is, you know, my, my best opportunity to sort of get my feet wet, uh, especially with Patrick as the CEO handling most of like the businesses. Uh, business heavy lifting, <laughs> as opposed to to me having to like crunch numbers and all the stuff on the, on that back end. And I'm also been really excited at the opportunity in the tabletop design space. You know, when you're working with a publisher, you cede a lot of control over the final product to the publisher. Mm. In a, in a lot of ways, uh, it kind of is, it's a bit of a black box. You 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 sell your design to the publisher, and it comes out the other side. You know, a year or two later, with art and rule books and and different, you know, revisions to it. And some publishers let you be pretty hands-on, some not so much. And being part of this entrepreneurship, you know, being part of a company that is doing the design, this is hands-on all the way. So I get to uh, really get to craft the experience from start to finish, which is thrilling, actually. So so how did Rustbit Studios come, come to be or originally? Well, so we were working with uh, someone else, Michael and I, a couple years back, and things ended up kind of going, we had, ended up having a lot of disagreements. So we ended up leaving Strife AI. Personally, us, Michael, me, Ben, and Lexi all wanted to basically build a really polished, really like coherent, like really good, like, you know, game experience. And so we ended up basically going into the software accelerator at Bounce and, uh, you know, just basically just starting everything up there. And, you know, we've been basically going about the approach of not building the game in this stealth mode, which is kind of one of the, the common mistakes that a lot of, you know, startup founders can make is they'll, they'll build something in stealth mode for a couple of years, which we were doing at our previous company. And so, so we've been kind of like, we want to get this into players' hands quickly. You know, we want to get their feedback as soon as possible and figure out how can we make this better? You know, how can we improve? So on and so forth. And what was the founding insight, if you will? Like, did it come more of the desire to create this quality game and trying to figure out the the story that comes with that? Or was there this draw to the vision that you had for a, a game and, and creating the mechanics around it? What, what kind of comes first as you were thinking about, all right, we want to we want to create something here, getting started on that process? I would say the experience that I had was it was it was sort of team first. Like we had we had a really good core team at Strife AI that was focused on doing the the game design and when it seemed like we weren't going to be working on the game design much anymore, we kind of got together and we're like, well, we we really want to focus on doing game design. Uh, that that's where our hearts are and that's where the passion is. And so when we went into doing founding Rustbit, like we had ideas for what we wanted to do, but uh, as Patrick said, like we were not building in stealth mode. Like we were iterative, and we were building the smallest MVP that we could to sort of get our minds wrapped around like what we wanted, what was possible, uh, and how how big we could uh, make the scope for that. So I would say like the company came first and the game came second. And you know we're working on the grip of madness now, but like we definitely kicked a couple of other ideas around and have little tiny prototypes uh, built on some server sitting somewhere where you're you're like, is this fun or not? Well, <laughs> you know, and the grip of madness was the first one that sort of had that bit of like lightning in a bottle feel. Where we're like, yeah, okay, we're onto something here with this one. And what what about it was, as as you put it out there, not building a self mode, getting feedback early. What are those indications that that you're onto something relative to some of the other ideas that that you were working through? I've been running playtest groups for and participating in playtest groups mm-hmm. for a long time. You can sort of tell when you've got something that's a little bit electric. The players respond in a certain way. People want to play again. 
like immediately. They're like, oh, let's, you know, like, let's boot it back up. Let's, let's give it another go. And the sort of core tenets of the game design in Grip of Madness had so much possibility space. It was, it was exciting from like the smallest nugget. And I, and I could just look in each direction, like all the way to the horizon with great game ideas all along the way. Like some of these are going to work, some of these aren't going to work, but it's not like the game design didn't feel hemmed in and it was already sort of crackling with energy. So I was like, yeah, like this is, this is, this has got, you know, uh, potential here. Yeah. And then when it's like, you know, you see, so we took our game to, we, we exhibited the game at a, a convention in Columbus called GDEX. Basically, we had like, you know, players just sit down and just try the game and everything. And like, honestly, we just saw like their reactions. We had several people come back to play like dozens of times, you know, and just people were just having like just all around like a great time with it. Like, you know, you we have people like kind of, you know, bickering, yelling and screaming at each other, you know, having like a really good time and everything. It's like building like those kinds of memorable experiences is really what kind of like helps to just know that you're onto that that thing. Yeah, it's something you can't fake. Like you, you when you have something that hits, you can you can see it and and players you know, you can see in the way players act, you can see the way players talk to each other and to you, you know, it, all the signs were there. Mm. Ben, one thing I'm, I'm curious about is as you kind of made the transition from tabletop board games to to digital, right, video games, what is the transferable aspect of that, that, that process there? I mean, a lot of the skills at the core of it are transferable. So when you're building games, be them tabletop or or digital, you're trying to come up with core gameplay loops that are satisfying and, and build on themselves. It's a lot of progress through iteration, so you'll come up with an idea and you have to play test it and see how things react with the players because you'll, you know, you'll theory craft something in your mind. You're like, this is going to be so great. And then the moment you get it in front of people, it, it just dissolves, <laughs> you know, and you have to listen to your players about like, what are the parts that they are excited about? You know, the thing that you think is great about a game might not be the thing that players think is great about a game. And so you, you really need to, it's, it's a lot of like listening to feedback and being iterative. I would say it's, easier to prototype in tabletop. So like, you know, I don't need to know any code when I'm doing tabletop design and I can print something out, cut it up and have the physical components right in front of me. But uh, it's way easier to play test in video games. I get to maybe one, maybe two play test events for, for tabletop games if I'm lucky a month. And with a video game, you can just boot it up and kick the tires on it whenever you want and then come up with ideas and and run it to your to your dev team and say like this is these are things that we could do or these are ideas that I had and and you just don't you don't have to wait for uh, everyone else's schedule to line up to get six people in a room to to play a game to set the stage here for the the rest of the conversation so everyone has a a sense for what the game actually is and then we can kind of go deeper into mechanics and and the market and and the, the way you're thinking about the business but what is the the grip of madness how, how do you how do you describe it so the grip of madness is a it's a cooperative first person shooter uh, with a betrayal mechanic and that's that's how we normally how we pitch it and everything basically the idea is is that there are these eldritch horrors that are invading our world and it's up to you and your friends to stop them and everything and you do that by fighting off the monsters that are invading gathering clues and completing this ritual to save the world. In our current demo, that's basically finding the three objects of power and bringing them to the special ritual location. However, at a random point in the game, there's one person that gets randomly selected as a traitor. So no one else knows about that and everything. They gain a special traitor ability, and they basically are turning against the rest of the team. And their goal is to... Uh, basically prevent that ritual from taking place and doing it at any means necessary by, you know, stealing and hiding things, you know, causing just all around mayhem to just downright, you know, backstabbing their former teammates. 
And throughout the game, you know, there are things that are kind of changing in the environment. So it's like, you know, you know, you might see things that are there that weren't there anymore. So it's like kind of a it's it's a horror game that has multiplayer elements in it mixed in with uh, social deduction. So if you're familiar with games such as like Among Us or Werewolf or any kinds of games like those, we've taken a lot of elements from those kinds of, of games, both in the tabletop space and the video game space. I want to just pull a little bit on the the horror thread and, and where that kind of comes in and just the, I don't know, again, as you're thinking about, I'm just kind of fascinated by the designing of games and the baking in of different incentive models and, and, and all the mechanics, just as I was like thinking about the work that you guys are doing, where like the, the story and all of that just comes from originally, like the, the creative process, if you will. So honestly... We love like horror games, horror movies, and like, you know, things like that. I'm particularly a big like retro 1980s VHS horror fan. So and that's actually kind of a, 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 a pivot that we're making in terms of like style going forward for the Grip of Madness. Honestly, we wanted to build a game that had like a lot of immersion and that had like a very tense feeling to it. And going down with the kind of horror aspect I probably would say is is the it's a very great way to make a game that has like a lot of atmosphere and a lot of like just building a lot of tension and distrust between each other because it's a it's a social deduction game. And so I'd probably say that that was probably like our inspiration and why we chose to go down that path. Plus, horror games are just fun and just really popular and people (laughs) seem people love them. So, you know, why not? (laughs) When I think about what it might take to build a game I feel like the the typical understanding that people might have is very it teams of like a hundred people at this point to to your point about working in stealth working over years before a product is out that someone can actually use and and play in the wild one of the things I'd love to understand is just how the actual development of of the game works from a financing perspective, from a process perspective, from a timing perspective, um, and how you guys have thought about from a, an indie game, just kind of the the macro view of of what's happening in the whole video game industry. Yeah. So, so the Grip of Madness is on a projected development time frame of about two years, which is pretty standard for most video games. A lot of indie games tend to be, can be shorter, sometimes it can be longer. It ultimately really depends on kind of what you want the the scope of the game to be. So when it comes to like, especially AAA games, uh, it could be, you know, upwards of 100 to 300 people. And even nowadays, like in the indie game space, it could be like 100, uh, like 100 people. What we're doing is, is a little bit different because of the fact that we are, you know, constrained by the number of people that we have and everything we are actually kind of coming up with more creative ways to basically build a game that is not, basically we're able to get a lot more use out of our assets that we create. Um, So for instance, we actually built a really cool technology that is, it's a procedural generation system in which like our artists can basically build like a bunch of small pieces of these maps and everything. And it literally like stitches them all together and everything and creates like a different experience every time. And like, we just need to just throw more content at it, really. And it just gets more and more complex. A lot of, you know, indie game studios that want to build like really polished experiences will often reach for, you know, building uh, games that have things like procedural generation, uh, games such as like Minecraft or Deep Rock both have them, things like that. So that way you can get kind of more use out of your assets uh, that you create for a game. So it's not like, you know, you're having to create like a new map with every meticulous detail like put in, you know, you just build like small pieces of it and it just, it expands all out. So, which is pretty neat. So it's like, we're, we're able to kind of like come up with like, you know, things like that. So we're able to, you know, create technologies that helps, you know, accelerate the development that way. I'd also say like, you know, being able to do what's called Steam Early Access is a really significant part too, where basically you can release the game to the public and everything on Steam. And there's just a disclaimer that, hey, this game isn't done yet, but you know, you're, you're, you pay for it and you get the opportunity to you know, collaborate with the developers on it, you know, get feedback and basically kind of build out the game and make it even better. 
a lot of indie developers have been going down that route um, where they release onto Steam early access so that way they can start like generating revenue. So that way they're not, you know, years into development and everything and they're not making a dime off the game. Yeah, I imagine with the proliferation of video games, particularly in the in addition to kind of the, the mainstream video game development, there's just kind of a, an ever increasing amount of options uh, for people, for, for players, right, who are, who are participating in these games. Um, oh, I'm yeah. curious how, how you've thought about differentiation, and it sounds like Steam gives you some of that distribution uh, up front, and maybe you can build a, a cohort of, of folks who feel invested as players as they get to work with you, but, but how, do you, how do you distinguish yourself as Signal from, from the noise of the video game and game world? I would say like one of our key strategies is we are building this game to be social out of the box. Hmm. We we find that the 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 strongest way to spread the game is word of mouth and if the game our game is multiplayer only so you need to find a couple other people to hop on and experience it with it. So it's not just one person playing in isolation it's people playing with their friends it also makes it much more streamable so we're hoping to get some streamers and plus because we're doing this open you know dev policy we highly encourage our people to join the discord with us and give us the feedback so we're hoping that with that extra level of basically hands onness that players can have with the with the shape and development of the game itself it'll foster investment and you know, have people excited, like, hey, you know, like I, I gave feedback for this game and the devs were responsive and, you know, perhaps some idea that somebody wanted uh, to see in the game has, has made it in. I mean, some don't, <laughs> some things are just <laughs> not feasible in the world of, of game development, but, you know, a lot of times our players will come up with things that we hadn't even thought of that are doable that just get us, get us really excited. So yeah, we're, we're, we're open we're small, we're scrappy and we're social. Yeah, and I would probably say, like, to add on to that, too, especially with, like, Steam sales as of late, you know, and and things of the like, is that players aren't actually afraid to, like, spend money. They're more uh, conservative with their time as opposed to, like, you know, spending money, which which is interesting. So it's, like, really, it's a matter of making a game that's, like, worth people's time, you know? Are they, are they willing to drop, you know, 60 hours into a game and everything? And it's, like, you know, if that's the case, then it's, like, you know, you made a game that's like a worthwhile investment. The whole dynamic of soliciting this this feedback and input from the gamers and kind of incorporating into the game, it's a really cool just mechanism. I am curious, like you mentioned some ideas that you guys haven't even conceived and and brought to you by the players. How you decide an idea is is a good one. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) And to run with it. (laughs) I mean, I've been doing it for a decade, you know, doing the game design. So I, I, I like to think perhaps I have a little bit of ability to, to, to sift through, sift through the pile, but like you'll see people say something at a play test event and other players will go, yeah, that's a great idea. And you're like, all right, better write that down because, <laughs> and I mean, like, like an, like an easy example is this game in this game, when you take damage and other things, they, they can hurt your sanity. So as your character loses sanity, you start to have what we, what we call our madness effects. Uh, these are in-game hallucinations that, that change the way the game appears to you. So you might see one of your friends as one of the enemy characters, or you might see an enemy that's not even there. And we have a whole bunch of them that are planned out. But like the moment you tell people like, yeah, you know, we have these madness madness effects in the game people like immediately uh spot off like oh it would be so cool if like i heard gunshots coming from a room and there was no one in that room i'm like yeah that that's a great idea and that's just us playing sound at a random interval at Mm. some some spot so like that's easy enough to to include so people get excited and and they want to they want to contribute and it's just up to us to you know, especially, you know, we are a small team. And what I, one of the things is like we always talk about is scope. It's like what what is possible, what's not possible, what's within our budget. You know, when, when you talk about budgets, budgets is also time. And, you know, we're, we're, we're on a development cycle. So it's like, well, we could include this, but it would be, you know, I don't know, a week worth of programming. You know, is it worth it? Where other things is like, yeah, I can get that done in 20 minutes. I'm like, by all means, throw that in there because it'd be great to have. 
what what has been the the reception so far as you've gotten the game out there? What what are what's the kind of feedback that you're getting? What are what are folks most excited about? Uh, and and in turn, what are you guys most excited about hearing the the sentiment? Honestly, by and large, like the feedback has been it's honestly been like on like a lot of things that we've we've kind of been thinking about already. So it's been like a lot of like honestly, like a lot of like minor polishing details, a lot of like balancing things, you know, figuring out like how like things like kind of interact with each other. Oh, you know, this certain weapon in the game doesn't do that much damage, but it's like, you know, this needs to be a more powerful character, you know, things like that. Oftentimes, funny enough, right? Uh, you know, we've had like a lot of like feedback where it's like, you know, we've been thinking that too. And so like just hearing this from you, like, you know, it makes a lot of sense. But overall, like the 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 reception that we have gotten is just honestly like just a lot of people getting like really really excited about the game. I I, I mentioned about it earlier about uh, GDEX and everything, and that we had like you know people who were like, "Oh, you were the traitor," and they're just kind of you know they would like argue with each other and everything. And but but overall, like having like a really really good time uh, and everything. And it was, um, I actually remember even getting like called out as like, you know, oh, you're the guys who made the grip men is like, just like randomly on the streets in Columbus, uh, with my, my respite t-shirt on and everything. Uh, and you know, like I've seen, I've seen people at the university of Akron with our stickers, uh, on their like phones and their water bottles and whatnot, as I walk through like the student union. So it's like, it's like just honestly like just super exciting to see like other people like just like checking out what we're doing and having like that overall positive reaction to things and just you know just being able to see the potential where the game can go. You know, we want to we want to bring all we want to bring everyone on that journey with us. And we're just like really excited to just see where where everything goes. When you think about the the kind of evolution of of the game over time is there a point at which it is done? It, right? Is, <laughs> right is, is, the, is the game ever done? Games aren't done. Games are shipped. That's that is a that is a maxim that 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 exists within the game design industry. But we we've been very good about setting benchmarks for ourselves and then having real real tough conversations about like what is possible. Uh, we have we have a big demo update coming up here on May second that we're super excited for. It adds the procedural generation that Patrick was talking about, and and we have like real conversations about like, well, what what additional features uh, are we going to prioritize and and put in, and and like I said, you know, like our game has three like main. You know, it's like a three pronged stool. It's got the co op shooter, it's got the trader mechanic, and it's got the madness effects. And we we always come back to that core and ask ourselves, like, is the thing that we are working on building on those on those three prongs? And it that that helps us sort of you know funnel our vision so that we're not we're not getting ourselves lost in the wilderness. And so as long as the experience feels complete, we think we are on the path. And so we're basically, you know, like the MVP felt like a complete experience, short, but a complete experience. And so like, all right, well, now we need to build an experience that'll keep a player for five to 10 hours. And so that's what our next build is. And then after that, we're like, all right, let's see what we can put in here to like extend that play time to, to give players more value for the money and the time that they put into it. So we, we're players first and foremost. We're doing game design because we like games. And so we approach our design decision saying, like, if I was a player purchasing this game or interested in the grip of man, it's like, what would I want to see? What would keep me playing? What would get get me excited to tell my friends? And then we say, as long as that aligns with our with our core values of what we're putting into this game, like, let's see if we can't pull it off. Yeah, and even after the game goes into what's known in the industry as a gold release, uh, so that just means that the the game is the game is done. It is it's the it's ready for for packaging and shipping out to stores. It's a really antiquated uh, metaphor and everything, but uh, <laughs> but it's basically like where where you get to that 1.0 release, and even after that, there's often the expectation that you plan on updating the game. You know, long after that, even 
you know, adding in new content, you know, introducing, uh, you know, you'll hear a lot of like other games do it where there's like, there's like new seasons and everything where they add new content uh, and, and just things of the like. When it's done and it's in that 1.0, it's like, it's not really done. There's still more stuff that you can just add and everything. You know, you really just have to see, like Ben was mentioning, does this really comp, does this complement the core mechanics of the game? So yeah, we're building with an eye towards the future. Like we 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 have plans for what will be in the initial release, and we have plans for what, uh, as long as the response is there, we would put in afterwards. But the the other big benefit of doing you know a gold release is that we can then read the reviews and see what the players like and what they don't like, and we can put in more of what players like. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a it's a nice feedback loop there. I I, I feel like relative to under other industries it's 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 such a direct feedback and and kind of symbiotic relationship gamer and and designer i i'm pulling on that thread a little bit more i am i'm curious you know as you think about what to build next for the game you're know, taking a step back as a as a gaming studio how you think about the the future generally like are, are you planting the seeds for for other games or is really there a focus purely on the grip of madness right now and and kind of the the nature of how you start to think about prioritization of what comes next and ultimately you know the direction the impact that that you want to have as a as an organization yeah so honestly we've been you know we have been kind of keeping an eye on that that aspect it's like We've been wanting to make sure that like our company culture is set up so that it's like, you know, we have like, we have a really positive company culture. You know, we have we have like libraries that we can like basically take out of the grip madness and use in future games. And, you know, we have so many like shelved ideas for for future games that Rustbit could develop. And I'm certain that Ben can generate 50 more because, you know, when it, when it came to like building the grip of madness, what, what Ben basically does is that he will go into a, he will go into a Google doc and he will just write out 50 game ideas and everything complete with mechanics and ideas and themes and everything. And it's like, okay, we'll just, we'll just pick from that list. And, uh, you know, so it's like, we can easily, we could easily do that again. And like, honestly, you know, with the technology that we've built in the grip of madness, and also all the experience that we have gotten from growing a business uh, and everything. Like I'm honestly, you know, I'm focused right now on making sure the grip of madness is, you know, poised to be a success. It has at least that chance to be that success, but also, you know, we're hoping that we're, we're, we are, you know, planting those seeds in Rustbit and making sure that it's like, you know, we're, we're also building this business to be sustainable and everything. Like we're a great team. We want to keep making games after the Grip of Madness together. Like right now we're fully focused on the Grip of Madness, but you know, I mean, I've freelanced as a game designer for so long. I've got I've got a Rolodex of things that that we can we can bring to the fore. And and on on top of that, you know, what I did learn working with Strife, uh, you know, we were doing a lot of that machine learning game stuff it sort of retooled my approach to game design be like, if we have to include certain mechanics or as Patrick was saying, certain libraries that we developed for previous games, like what is the best way to retool work that we've already done in a way that we can efficiently build like the next project. So we don't have anything in the works currently. We have ideas uh, about things mm -hmm. that we can do. And I'm, I'm, you know, like I said, I'm always working on game designs and, and, uh, you know that 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 is also a benefit. You know, I still do freelance tabletop game design, and sometimes I run into ideas. That I'm like, yeah, you know, like this would be better or easier to implement digitally. And before, I used to have no way to do anything with that, and now it's like, well, I'll just put that in my back pocket and save it for Rustbit Studio. <laughs> <laughs> From the the outside in, what would you say is generally are people's biggest misconceptions about what it is to build games? Well, as a business, I would probably say the fact that a lot of people, for some reason, have this perception that running a video game studio is somehow different from any other business. Like, oh, you know, there's a different, you know, pitching process when it comes to getting funding. Or, you know, there's just some sort of secret society that's involved in the, the game design space. And, and the truth is, is that, that it's, you know, 
you know, building video games is no different than, you know, doing a technology startup, like build, like building a game studio. You know, honestly, like when it comes to like talking to people and everything, there are some, there are some minor differences, you know, so it's like, you know, you might not go for, in, in terms of like the pitching aspect, you know, you might not go for, you know, VC money, but you might instead go for, you know, go and pitch to publishers instead. So it's like kind of got like kind of a parallel to like book publishing, for instance, um, has some similarities to that. But you could also go down a VC route. And there are like, you know, venture capital firms that are interested in video games. Um, so some are, most aren't. But, you know, it really depends on how you how you're pitching it and what you're actually, you know, doing. But yeah, it's like, really, there's just there, there's there's no difference to it. And so, you know, being able to kind of clear up the air about that. And, you know, it's like if you have like a compelling a compelling game, a compelling product, it's like, you know, and you market it, people are going to be interested. What, what was your approach to to those same set of options from a from a from a funding perspective, like getting getting it off the ground? Yeah. So currently, right now, we're in the we're in the pitching process of pitching to publishers. Uh, we're currently pitching it as a what's called uh, in the video game space. There is uh, the the what we call the premium model and the free to play model. The free to play model is the one that most people are are, are familiar with. Um, the premium model is basically you know you go out. You buy the game, you own a copy of it, you know, you're able to download it and, and play it, you know, and whatnot. Uh, we are currently going down the premium model. So we're going to, you know, pitch it to publishers as such. And so, and that has like certain implications, you know, how much money do you need to build this game? You know, what's your planned price point? What's your update schedule look like? And I mean, those things are important from a free to play um, aspect as well, but they're also really focused like on like the economies, you know, what are your microtransactions look like, uh, things of the like. Um, so for the grip of madness, it is primarily going, we're, we're, we're planning on making it a premium game and, and such. So, and so we're kind of in that pitching process right now for it. Ben, it, it looked like you were going to introduce some of the misconceptions people may have. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it, well, no, it was fine. If we could, if we can rewind time like that, Prince of Persia, Santa time. But uh, <laughs> I, I would just say no game design is a smooth path. I think people have this misconception that uh, you will have an idea for a game and that is the perfect encapsulation of, of the idea and the mechanics. And nothing should change from the moment of conception to the moment of release. And I find maybe an, one or two auteurs can pull that off. But like really, uh, especially in the digital uh, space, more so than the tabletop space, like game design is collaborative. Like I'm working on a team of four. I've got two game devs I gotta work with who handle the programming and tell me what can't can and can't be done. We have a wonderful artist on staff who 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 brings her own ideas about what the theme and, and such is. And we have all of the playtesters who like tell us when things are working and when they're not working. And so it is not a straight shot to the final product. It is a wobbly line. Uh, you you want to give yourself a couple of guide stars to sort of aim at so that you don't get lost in the wilderness but you know you will take detours and and off ramps and and find things but like the the key to like making the process work is is look at these things as opportunities when you when you run into a problem if something is not possible it's not that you are compromising on your vision you have to see like well if this is impossible are there things that i can do that would accomplish the same goal or is there things that i could do that are better that i haven't even thought of that i should just talk to the team about like the procedural generation mm. i didn't think was possible <laughs> <laughs> we, we were we were we were originally talking about you know building static maps and and using the the item uh, item placements as as the way to sort of drive the replayability but then then michael's like i think i can make a procedural generation engine that that builds these things custom and i'm like well take a flyer on it you know if it works out you know <laughs> it really reduces our scope you know our load on our artist because it's not like we're going to have to be designing handcrafted le levels every month to try and like put put out like a, a new level at, uh because we can basically create more assets and then even backfill additional pieces into the to the back of it so like it was it was a solution to a problem 
And if I had thought like, no, like I have drawn hand little maps of exactly how the way I want the player flow and the hot spots to happen, I would have, you know, been much more resistant to, to something like that. But no, I'm, I'm glad we pulled it off. It's, it's super exciting. Oh, it sounds very exciting. <laughs> what, what have been your biggest learnings uh, through, through this journey so far? Things that, that you've taken with you along the way? I would say I have learned to collaborate better. <laughs> the tabletop industry, I, I, I've never done a, a co-design. I know a lot of people work with co-designers and stuff like that. And yes, I, I work with, with um, you know, I do take feedback and, and stuff like that and work with people in, in the team. But working in the creative space on a team really requires a lot of killing of the ego. And you, <laughs> you, you kind of have to learn to say like, my ideas are not me. My output is not me. Like I, it's team, team above I. And as much as I'm relying on other people in this team, they're relying on me. So like you have to learn to collaborate and sort of find where the guardrails are and then respect those guardrails. We're not perfect <laughs> and I'm not perfect. So I will put that <laughs> I in there. But, you know, I think it has been actually incredibly freeing to have to have people whom I trust to to sort of fall back on you know like I will send stuff out into the ether and then the rest of the team will just absolutely kill it like make it the best the best implementation of that with extra ideas t- uh, on there that I hadn't even like considered and I'm like you like you guys y'all made this <laughs> better than better than uh better than I had expected and so you know it's it's a lot of that trust And I'd probably say for me, you know, honestly, much like Ben, it's like, you know, you, you have to really detach yourself from like, you know, the actual creative work you, you know, you make and everything, you know, because otherwise you're going to become very defensive over your own ideas and everything. And I have seen that, you know, so many times where, you know, just because like, you know, you, the developer thinks that this game is fun doesn't necessarily mean that everyone else is going to think that's, that's a, that's a fun game. So it's like, you know, being able to really listen to your players and like get their feedback and everything is honestly like probably one of the most important things you can do. Cause it's like, you know, you can just go out, you know, spend six or seven years building a game that you think is super cool. And, you know, if you're doing it just simply as a passion project, that's, that's great. That's awesome. You know, but it's like, you know, if you're under the expectation that, you know, you want other people to enjoy it, well, you have to make a game that, you know, other people are going to enjoy that other people are going to like. And so it's like, you know, being open to that feedback that, you know, those people provide you and just seeing where the trends are, I I think is like probably some of the biggest learnings that I have taken away. I realize I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you both for what your favorite video games are. Oh dear. <laughs> it's like asking someone what their favorite movie is. Um, I can tell you, I can tell you. You don't keep a uh, spreadsheet of that? Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> so currently right now, I've been, probably one of my favorite games I've been playing through right now. I'm a big fan of flight sim games, uh, co- uh, combat flight sim games. So I've been playing a game called Ace Combat 7. It is an immensely fun game. I have a blast with it every single time. But then there's also like, you know, 50 others that I, I could list. I mean, I could probably spend, you know, the next 50 minutes just talking about my favorite <laughs> game. So, but I'll, I'll just leave it at there. <laughs> I think the, the, the new hotness that's out there right now, Elden Rings, I've been, I've been kicking around. I've always been a, a, a big Souls player from the Dark Souls 1. So I wasn't on mm. the original train with Demon Souls because I didn't have a PS3. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but th- those are great. If you're at, if you're wondering like what game really inspired me for the grip of madness, I would say uh, the first couple Dead Space games were just killer, mm. uh, so atmospheric, such a good use of interesting new mechanics in in ways to sort of drive home the horror. And if you're asking where my soft spot is, like all those old SNES titles, like that was my childhood. So like Super Mario World, Final Fantasy VI, Kirby Superstars, uh, or All-Star oh, yeah, Collection. Yeah. Like, man, there was so much, <laughs> so much gold on that, on that system. So I I, I guess I uh I've been I have quite the the long history of, of of sitting in front of a television and and blasting my my retinas with lights and sounds. 
<laughs> me, me being slightly younger than Ben by a couple of years, uh, I, I grew up with the the PS2 and everything. So like, you know, all of the games on there, you know, like like Jack and Dexter, Ratchet and Clank, a lot of like 3D mm. platformers, I'd probably say are also my soft spot as well. So I, I want to maybe bookend the, the conversation here with any plugs or, or calls to action you guys have for uh, the game and, and what's coming next. Well, so like like we mentioned, uh, we've got a major demo update coming on May 2nd. So I'd recommend just, you know, checking out the demo then. Uh, Steam.gripofmadness.com is an easy way to get to the Steam store page. You know, if you if you like what you see, give it a wish list. Wish lists are, you know, kind of really one of those key uh, metrics that helps us really grow the game. I'd also say, like, join our Discord. You know, we love hearing what people have to think about the game. Uh, and so that's at discord.gripofmadness.com. And then you can also, we also have a mailing list as well, which you can check out at rustbit.com. Awesome. Well, the, the closing question that uh, we have for everyone uh, on the show is for not necessarily your, your favorite thing in the area, but for your favorite hidden gems in Akron. I am a, I, I play a lot of disc golf. Uh, <laughs> so oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Cleveland and Akron have some actual good quality courses there. I throw out a uh, Parma disc golf course in Veterans Memorial Park is fantastic. And their group there main, does a great job of maintaining it. I like Sims Park in Euclid. It's on the water. So you get uh, a lot of uh, weather conditions. You don't necessarily <laughs> get in other courses <laughs> if the wind is really uh, whipping off the Lake Erie. And But probably my, my favorite course is called Roscoe Ewing in Medina. It is the oldest course in in Ohio, so we're lucky to have that here in this Northeast Ohio area. And it's beautiful, well laid out, well maintained, just Jeff's kiss, uh, just a, a great <laughs> course. So uh, if you if you have any interest in in disc golfing, I, I would say the Northeast Ohio area is 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 kind of brimming with with uh, good options. And I'd say for me, uh, you know, I am someone who. I'm I'm a big coffee lover, so I personally I don't know how much of a hidden gem it is, but Akron Coffee Roasters uh, in downtown Akron um, has some of the best, you know, highest quality coffee that I've ever experienced. Like I I know almost everyone who works there. It's honestly like just and it's really amazing just to be able to like nerd out over coffee and everything, like literally <laughs> about coffee. Uh, like I actually I, I have some ACR coffee right here right now. And then like right next door to it is a single screen like art house cinema that's a nonprofit, the nightlight. It is a it is an amazing uh, little movie theater that's just filled with like just passionate people who just love cinema. I'm a big cinema. I'm a big cinephile myself. So yeah, I just, I, I think that those two places are just like absolutely my faves. So I haven't been to Cleveland enough, so I don't have any favorite <laughs> hidden gems there quite. You yet. haven't been up to the cinema tech yet. So <laughs> I have not, I've been up to this, I've been up to this theater up on the, on the East side off of Lee road, but uh, only Cedar Lee. Yeah. Cedar Lee. That's it. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Very old school. <laughs> well, awesome. Uh, ben, Patrick, really appreciate you guys coming on and, and sharing the the story of Rustbit and the work that they all are doing with the group of madness. I'm looking forward to, to giving it a shot and uh, really appreciate you guys coming on. Thanks for having us. It's so it's so glad to be here and then get the chance to spread the word. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeffrey. It's really been a pleasure. Awesome. Well, it, it sounds like if folks have anything they'd like to follow up with you about, maybe Discord is is the best place. But any other any other shout outs for for where folks can follow up with you guys? Yeah, I mean, if, they, if you if they're interested, they're welcome to email us at hello at rustbit.com or you can just join us on Discord, discord.gripandmadness.com. That's all for this week. Thank you for listening. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show. So if you have any feedback, please send over an email to jeffrey at layoftheland.fm or find us on Twitter at podlayoftheland or at sternhefe, J-E-F-E. If you or someone you know would make a good guest for our show, please reach out as well and let us know. And if you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or on your preferred podcast player. Your support goes a long way to help us spread the word and continue to bring the Cleveland founders and builders we love having on the show. We'll be back here next week at the same time to map more of the land. 
The Lay of the Land podcast was developed in collaboration with The Up Company, LLC. At the time of this recording, unless otherwise indicated, we do not own equity or other financial interests in the company which appear on this show. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of any entity which employs us. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.